How's it going everyone? I am Dylan, this is Carlo, this is All You Can Board, and today we have a really cool video that we're gonna be doing, and that is 10 games that can teach you. Now, uh, the way we're approaching this video is sort of, uh, these are games that taught us something, and it could be, uh, any number of things, each one is gonna have taught us something different. And it's very, very possible it could teach you the same things, but obviously these ones are a little bit unique to us and we're pulling from personal experience here. Uh, and if you're curious what gave us the idea to do this video, it's uh, the fact that uh, Carlo and I, in about, from the time we're filming this, in about a week's time, a little bit over a week, um, we're actually gonna be uh, speaking at a conference um, as the keynote presentation, which is super exciting for us and a little nerve wracking. As yeah, well. I couldn't believe we were really asked to do this, but yeah. uh, we're, we're thrilled. It's uh, it's a conference for um, in, here in Manitoba for Manitoba educators to attend on their prof uh, professional development day, um, and this one is specifically targeted towards games uh, being used in the classroom and as, as a teaching tool, things like that. And we're gonna be talking about board games and mental health, which one of the reasons we're bringing it up here is because that is directly correlated to what we did in May with our uh, mental health live stream event, uh, which saw so much success because of our entire community and all of you. And I think that that's a big part of why we're able to, you know, talk at this conference and, yeah. and continue the conversation, which we're really, uh, you know, thrilled about. But it's just an opportunity for us to give another big thanks to all of you for, you know, making this kind of stuff happen because your yeah. support made it happen. Absolutely. Yeah, we came up with the idea maybe, but it, it was only a success and it's only continuing to be a success because of all of you. Yeah, and I think the people who reached out to us for this keynote were only like, sort of on board for the idea because we had done that event previously yeah, so exactly so big thanks and uh, if you are a manitoba educator and uh, you're looking for something to do in your pd day uh, the link will be in the description and feel free to sign up yeah it's friday october 21st correct um, okay, so I'm going to throw it to you uh, to give your first game. These aren't ranked in any specific order. These are just five games each, ten games total that have taught us something. And tell us the first game that taught you yeah, something. Yeah, and we haven't uh, gone over picks with each other in advance, so I think we each have one or two backup picks because we're trying not to have overlap. We want to yes. have ten different games, right? So the first game uh, I'm going to talk about today that has taught me something that can also teach you something is The Crew, Mission Deep Sea. So I will say, uh, I haven't actually played the Mission Deep Sea version. I've only played uh, the Quest for Planet Nine, but everything I know about this uh, has led me to believe this is probably the superior version, as Dylan has so convincingly uh, put it in a video <laughs> a little while back as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a really, really good, uh, in my opinion, the best cooperative game around. Plays two to five players. Uh, Trick-taking, limited communication game. Um, where you're basically everyone's getting a little sort of objective at the start and you're trying to play cards without communicating with each other um, in order to sort of end up getting certain people to win the, the hand of cards or to lose the hand of cards so if someone gets certain cards to complete certain objectives. Uh, we've talked about it a lot on the channel before so I won't go any more into the rules or anything like that and how it plays but what this game has taught me, number one, is how much I love limited communication in games because we had played a couple other limited communication, and specifically in co uh, cooperative games, of course. We had played um, Hanabi, I think, as our first limited communication cooperative game, probably. Mm -hmm. And the experience wasn't great, and I think it's because <laughs> the people we were playing with were <laughs> yeah. kind of bending the rules a little bit, and like when we would be holding the cards, they'd be kind of going, oh, no, like making little <laughs> sounds that would hint at what you had. So we were like, it was yeah. kind of out, out of the spirit of the game. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really like love Hanabi the first time I played it. And then we got to play The Mind, and I really did enjoy The Mind quite a bit, but it still didn't feel like it wasn't like one of my top favorite games ever kind of thing. And I think this made my top 10 when we did our top 50 games of all time last time. Um, it just reminded me that, yeah, the the this has the perfect amount of that limited communication where you still have the little communication token where you can send one signal by placing a card and putting the token in a different spot on the card to kind of send a message to the rest of your teammates. Um, I just, yeah, I love what this does, and it kind of really opened my eyes to what a cooperative game can be and, and showed me that I maybe I do like cooperative games more than I thought. I just, I like the limited cooperation uh, or communication aspect rather than everyone sitting around a table, you know, arguing, trying to come to the best thing. And then I think this kind of um, prevents that kind of alpha gamer or, or um, quarterbacking issue that can come up in a lot of games where one person can just say, no, this is clearly the best move, let's do this. And everyone goes, oh yeah, fair enough. Feels like everyone has like an equal sense of agency in this because you all have to play a card and you really can't talk a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. This was actually one of my options, um, and oh, that's and that's because for me, and I'm, I'm glad though because it should be up here. But my uh, reason was just slightly different, even though I agree with everything you're saying. It was more 
um, just that it taught me to be a better cooperator. I mm. think I think that I actually left right. my sessions of the crew just in general, even probably outside of the board gaming space, just a better equipped to cooperate because you have to specifically do within the confines of like you know the limited communication of this game. True. So suddenly, when you're all of a sudden introduced to cooperation with that communication not being restricted, mm -hmm. you're naturally better at it because you're like, well, I had to do all this communication limited, true, and I was yeah. good at it, and now suddenly I have my my clip my communication back and it's like oh this is so much easier right that's true so, and i guess you could get get away with playing a game like pandemic without saying anything and just kind of being part of the group yeah. while other people are making decisions this so it is, kind of forces you to be more involved yeah like this is honestly the kind of game that even for like you know younger audiences in a classroom setting whatever that teaching them about like cooperating with like these constraints and then removing the constraints and being like look how much easier this is is such a great opportunity as well yeah so, yeah and i also yeah. think it gives you an easier intro to trick taking than some of the mm -hmm. other games like when we played fox yeah. in the forest and stuff i liked them but sometimes we both talked about how we didn't really understand like what strategy what am i trying to do and with the with having objectives it kind of guides you a little bit more yep. so it's it just feels a little more like yeah it taught me how to get competent at trick taking kind of yeah thing, so. for sure um, I thought you were going to have the mind as the partial kind of overlap in terms of cooperative and limited. Well, it's so funny you say that because my backup pick. Oh. For... <laughs> I actually, I just realized I didn't actually grab it off my shelf and I, and I can't even reach it from where it is. So I'm going to put the, the little box out right yeah, here. Yeah. But yeah, so my backup pick is the mind. It's, it is nice. for a different reason. And the reason mm -hmm. the mind's on here is, I mean, yes, it's a cooperative game. Yes, there's limited communication. But specifically with the mind's limited communication, what I think it taught me is just how how to be better in tune with people even outside of like being able to like in general in life I try to like in the, especially in the last few years something that I really really care about is just having lots of empathy like I, I think that empathy is something that's missing in the world in general and uh, in you know a lot of places a lot of situations and the reason I bring that up is because you can see someone in a situation and you'll never quite know you know what they're what they're going through or like what's going on in their head or how their day was whatever and the minds the entire the entire you know function of the mind is essentially I have my own thing going on you have your own thing going on we don't know what we're each going mm -hmm. through right we we don't know what's in true. each other's hands and yet you have to try to be in tune with the person across the table to have success and that is the perfect analogy for empathy in the world you have you true. never you never know you never know what someone's going through and if you can find a way to strike that balance of being in tune uh, to figure out how to you know navigate each other and what you don't know you can have success right and so that's the entirety of the mind you're trying to put down numbers in the right order uh, without knowing what the person's uh, you know what number they have and uh, you know which one should go next um, and so I think it just taught me to like you know with the, each person I play with I learn a little bit better their characteristics their tendencies their facial expressions yeah. you know the, the pace at which they'll take risks and everything yeah, right level of patience they so have I would say that the mind has taught me more about my friends than almost any game I've played in yeah. some ways right even like, though you played in silence which yeah is interesting. exactly yeah. so so yeah it's similar in sense the cooperative game but I think it's different enough from the crew in that it teaches you sort of a different aspect of that mm. cooperation and being attuned with the person across the Damn. table so that is quite the pick and quite the reasoning That's, uh, <laughs> I think we could just wrap the video up right there and people would be satisfied that's about as good can of a we, pick as we're gonna get can we put this in our notes for the conference <laughs> yeah i was gonna say <laughs> yeah that so should have been the last pick we got eight more to go here damn that is the All mind right. my first pick well very well done very Thanks. well done okay so tough act to follow but we are going with a game that uh oh a little Ooh, game called genotype nice pick and so this is a game that's pretty new to me i've only played it once so far and it was solo um but it, it didn't feel right to me considering I've played two games now from Genius Games here. I felt like we had to have something by this company on the list because they're very scientific, educational, thematic games. Um, we've played this one and we've played Cellulose, yeah. I believe, but both just once each. Um, but Genotype is a game about uh, plant genetics, pea plants. Um, What's the word I'm forgetting now? Phenotypes, all kinds of stuff. I can't explain all this to you right now. I don't remember exactly how it all works. Um, but I thought but, it taught you about science. Yeah, Carl. well, I did, but I, it was a few weeks ago to Kevin. I forgot a little bit of the science behind it. Um, but yeah, just a very, very interesting game that kind of shows you the process of changing, you know, the genetics of the plants, uh, changing the phenotypes with, with these dice rolls. I'm not going to do a good job explaining it right now. It's kind of a not a confusing mechanism, but just it, it's something. Uh, fairly unique that I haven't seen mm -hmm. done in other games, but it's kind of a worker placement game that plays one to five players um, And again, it's just the it's just like dripping with theme It's it's a really nice game to look at too And I think that's part of what pulls you in so much is it? Um, 
Yeah, it's just a very like immersive experience. You've got little, you know, magnifying glasses and research books and little things like that. Um, and the other thing it taught me just out like, cause obviously I'm mentioning what it has taught me is kind of like the theme, the scientific aspect of this, of this subject. Um, but the other thing it taught me, and I mentioned this uh, in the video I talked about this game previously when I was talking about games I played solo at a cabin, was it taught me what my tolerance is for managing a bot in a solo game. So, which is not very high, <laughs> I'll say right now. Uh, if I'm playing, like, I, because over the last little while, whether it was, you know, from the start of the pandemic or becoming a dad, like, over the last couple of years in general, I've just started playing more solo games. And it wasn't something I did a whole lot of before. And it, if it was, it was usually a game that just like plays with more players, but just happened to have a solo mode. It was a good way to try it. But lately I've been trying to play more solo games. And this is the one that made me realize because there's like to manage the bot, the AI bot that you're playing against is like, it's like a four or five, six page rules thing. And it's like for every action, there's like a paragraph to read. There's an extra phase that happens for the bot that doesn't even happen for the human player. So you have to remember this thing. You have to have the rules open. And so, it, and I don't bring this up to disparage people from trying the game. I just think if you're gonna play it, I don't think solo is the ideal player count. I think it's probably gonna be best as a maybe two to four player game. I think it goes up to five. Um, but yeah, if you know, it's very educational. The theme is awesome. Um, but yeah, the, the one regret I have about it is that it, it did definitely teach me that the solo version of this game is not for me because I don't want to be making all these, looking through a manual to figure out what brother Johan does on his turn. Yeah, if you're looking for a game that has like a way more manageable bot system, you probably want to look at Oath. It's super streamlined, super <laughs> easy, very, very manageable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a simple yes, no flow chart. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, awesome pick. Uh, I consider putting cell cellulose on mine. I just feel I, it had been a while since I played it, but right. uh, and uh, it just I had other picks that I prioritized ahead of it. But like for the same reasons, like you said, the they are like you know rich in in the science theme, so that mm -hmm. for you know especially for younger audiences that are like in school and learning this stuff, or teachers that are looking for games to specifically like say this translates from what I've been teaching, or like mm -hmm. it makes mm -hmm. it fun, whatever. Games like Genotype, games like Cellulose are just like phenomenal picks. Yeah. So, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think this would be a great one for uh, for the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's Genotype. And again, check out other games by Genius Games if yeah. this plant theme doesn't interest you. All right, I'm going to go with uh, the next one will be a similar t type of reason to yours. We'll keep this kind of consistent. So my next pick is on the bottom of this stack. Oh my god. Well, I have a feeling I know what it is. Is uh, Wingspan. Yeah, that's, that was going to be my guess when you said it was a similar pick. Yeah, so nice. uh, Wingspan is a super popular game. Probably everyone already knows uh, about it, uh, but I'm sure there's some of you out there that don't. Um, it's this engine building game that involves obviously this bird theme, and you have different uh, ecosystems, or I can't remember what they're exactly called. With the There's like the three, the grasslands, the marsh, and... and yeah, the land the, types. Yeah, whatever, the, yeah, the land types, the ecosystems, whatever biomes um, and each one is going to have its own row of birds you're placing these birds into them each of them wants to be in different types of, of systems and each of them has an ability that's going to trigger in sequence from right to left uh, whenever you you know trigger that that line of abilities and you're trying to build an engine between them so that when something triggers it's you know they're all working in unison with each other you're the birds are laying eggs on, on the cards there's a whole bunch of cool stuff going on it's, it's a really popular game it's going to continue to be it's uh, i think become like our modern day version of like you know, Catan, Carcassonne, whatever, like yeah. one of those games that everyone is now being introduced to as yeah. like one of their yeah. first games. There aren't many games that sell a million copies, yeah. especially in, you know, that that quickly. Yeah, it's uh yeah, very it's and I really like it. It's it's a very good game. Um the reason it's on here is because even though I don't have pretty much any interest in, in birds all that much. Um, it naturally just teaches you about them because one, you're learning which birds want to be in which ecosystems and these aren't just like made up birds. It's not like it's just saying like Oh, this you know blackbird wants to be here, and it doesn't mean anything. Like they actually even have the scientific names, whatever that terminology mm -hmm. is called, like on each yep. card of like what species it falls into, and then it tells you like what ecosystem it wants to be in. So you're naturally, if you're really paying attention to the theme, you're going to learn about birds. You're gonna, and I could see this being used in that kind of sense, where if you're you know whether that's in school, whether that's just at home with your with your own children or your own personal reasons of wanting to learn, you can easily just be playing this game and, and looking at sort of each card as it comes up and being like, oh cool, like that's a weird name for a bird or I didn't realize that a bird like this would be in all these ecosystems, whatever. Yeah, and it lists the actual birds like wingspan and little yeah. characteristics right. about them too yeah. to be like, oh yeah, this bird has a really crazy like wide wingspan. And, so, and, like, and, it's and there'll be like, uh, 
uh, end game scoring conditions that'll say like you like your bonus is you have to have five birds that have over this wingspan. So it forces yeah. you to like look at that information. It's, exactly, it, observe it, it that's and actually retain what, that knowledge. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I completely forgot. And I remember the first time I played wingspan that that bonus card wasn't in place. So I remember looking at the wingspan on the cards and thinking like, oh, that's a cool idea to throw on a card as like extra like flavor right, text right. and then you realize they've actually incorporated it like into yeah, the, it is the awesome. game too well it, and like credit to elizabeth hargrave because she is an avid birder and like yeah. this is one of those games where the theme doesn't seem pasted on or like it was just kind of shoehorned in like it's very well integrated yeah yeah so that's really i mean that's really all it comes down to it just like it's a game that has the theme integrated so well and it's, it's not like it's the only one out there but it's the one that you know immediately came to my mind that even if you only have a passing interest or no interest you're just naturally going to learn some stuff if you choose to pay attention and i think that those are kind of like the passive learning is so important something that you know we, we we've i think everyone has talked about this when it comes to education stuff like that but like learning through play is such a huge thing for like obviously kids but even adults like mm -hmm. just an easy environment to learn when you're already doing something and you realize like oh, i didn't even realize but i've taken that knowledge away right. whatever um and wingspan is just a great opportunity to learn a whole bunch about birds and there's expansions for every region so you can start to learn like which birds are in asia yeah, which birds true. are in europe and yeah. stuff so yeah that's my that's my like scientific education. No, nice. And I'm really glad you had this on. I, this was on my kind of short list, but I, yeah. I thought you were going to have it on yours and you've played it a lot more than me, but I'm glad yeah. you had it because we don't have, or I'll say right now, I don't have any other engine builders on my mm -hmm. list and engine builders also teach you efficiency, right? Yeah, Cause big it's time. how to save actions, how to do something with two turns instead of making it take four turns. It's a great so mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really, really great game. Yeah. That's wingspan pick number two. Nice pick. Thanks. All right, on to my pick number three, which is a game I've spoken about on the channel many times. Oh, this is the one I, I know. I already know this one. I know really? This, I know this one, and this is the one I was going to include, but I was like, Carlos going to have it. Okay. This. One of the greatest games ever made, constantly getting, yes, constantly <laughs> rising in my ranks, Modern Art, yeah. from the good doctor, Reiner Knizia. I believe this game was from 1993 or 94 or something, so I it was like 30, 30 years great. old. So... Not only does like, so this has taught me a lot in terms of just like social kind of bartering, like it's not a negotiation game, but it is an auction game. Um, and so there's the aspect of, you know, basically you, you have, you get, everyone gets dealt a hand of cards and you play a card on your turn that represents a painting and it's going to be auctioned off. And throughout the game, there's four or five different types of auctions that are going to happen uh, based on what's noted on the card. And basically you're going to go around the table, people can bid. So there's like hidden auctions, there's, you know, one-time offers, you know, set price, all kinds of stuff. Um, game plays over multiple rounds, certain artist paintings get are worth more or less throughout the game, etc, etc. Won't get into any more of the rules, we've talked about this a lot on the channel before, but... Um, so what it has taught me is... Here's the thing, is I feel like every time I play it, I learn more. Like, every time I leave the game or the like, session ends, I feel like I've... There's a part of me that feels like I figured the game out, and I'm like, okay, I lost, but it's because I did that and that, so next time I'm gonna try this. And then the next game I'll try some... I'll try that, and I'll be like, oh, but that didn't work because of... Oh, I hadn't considered that aspect of when I buy something, you know, I, I kept thinking for the longest time, why would I buy a painting if I'm going to profit only like, let's say $6 net and by buying it from you and then you're going to profit like 12 or, or 18 or something, why would I buy a painting that someone else is going to profit off of? And then after a while I realized, but wait, if the two of us are profiting but the other three players at the table aren't, yeah, I'm not getting ahead of you, but I'm still getting ahead of the other three players. There's, it just feels like every time I have the economy system figured out, there's something else that I go, wait a sec, I didn't consider that aspect. And then we've played games where people do stuff like playing cards to end an auction where we think they're just wasting turns, but it's the way that you're shifting this economy. And that's the other reason why this made it in. It's the only economic game on this list. And it's an open economy because money can come into the game. Like everyone starts with a hundred bucks, but because when you buy a painting from a player, you pay them. But if you buy your own painting, you just pay the bank. And then at the end of the round, you're selling paintings, the bank pays you. So the money is shifting. So there's just so much to keep track of and so much going on. Like even just from like a math standpoint and kind of like a memory of trying to remember like, uh, maybe that person did really well that round. That person's been selling a lot of paintings, you know, these kind of like this artist cards have come out a lot or not enough of. And you're trying to figure that out while keeping track, or like while kind of like, having to be on the spot negotiating with people, coming up with valuations for paintings. Like there's just so much going on. It's a great like numbers game. People who are fans of 
you know, like, like in a classroom setting, people who are good at like mental math and numbers and that kind of thing, I think would love this game. And it's just so social. Everyone I've shown this game to has absolutely loved it. And we're always laughing. Win or lose, everyone has a great time. Um, yeah, I just feel like I learned something new from it and from the people around me almost every time I play it. Yeah, awesome pick. I echo everything you said. This is the one I almost considered as well. But I knew, I knew you, you knew have I it. have it, yeah. Um, it's hard. It, we, I know we do these lists, and I'm like, I don't want to, do I have to put modern art in there again? I'm like, <laughs> but it has to. It's the perfect game for But it me. does, and it teaches you yeah. about the actual art itself. Like, it's real yes. art and everything, like, which is a huge, because we're talking about, like, how these games t teach about science and everything, but it's it's nice to see a game also lean into, like, the art and the, like, that, that aspect true. of it and, and teach yeah. real art stuff as I'm well. I'm glad you brought that up. Even the artist names, like, mm -hmm. we saw there's four Brazilian artists here, and you can yep. see they all have their own styles that, you know, compared to the, the German artists that they have. Have in here and yeah the only thing you know. the only thing i'll add and this is just the, this is a more of an existential one that i think it teaches but i think it's another important okay. thing is it teaches you how to be mean and cutthroat with your friends and the reason that's important is because sometimes in life i'm really gonna get existential sometimes in life you have to be able to like have a real conversation with your friends you have to give them advice you have to say like i i'm worried about you for this or yeah. whatever and it's important early on to in games to be able to be like yeah, we're sitting around this table playing this game and we're being mean with each other because in Monopoly, I'm, you know, taking all your money or in modern art, you know, I'm outbidding you in the, in the shrewdest way that's going to make you be like, why do you keep doing this to me? We're outbidding but, just to drive up the price. But yeah. if you can leave that session and be like, but that's just within the confines of the game. That's just, that's what the game called for. It didn't change our relationship. It didn't change the way we feel about that's each other, whatever. Like, that's important. That's vital for like people to learn early on. That's vital for adults to know. And I feel like that carries over into everything. Like, you need to be able to like have a bunch of fun with your friends, but if one of them says something to you that's, you know, hurts you, be able to be like, hey, like, this is how this made me feel and not have that be like, well, we're mad at each other, friendship over. You yeah, know? yeah. You can't be in modern art like, well, this guy will bid me, like, we're never playing games with this guy It's again, true, right? it gives you a pretty safe place to kind of yeah. bump elbows a bit. Yeah, so I love this pick, great pick. Cool, thank you, that is modern art. Amazing, amazing game. Mm -hmm. All right, next game for me. I don't know if you're gonna have seen this one coming or not, maybe. It's gonna be Snake Oil. Oh, nice. Okay. And uh, Snake Oil, this one's super simple. This one is a little bit oh, specific okay. to me, maybe, but I think this would, this almost goes for a lot of party games that, of, of this you know, type of party, party game. And I think a lot of people can relate, hopefully, to what I'm saying here. This taught me to be more comfortable speaking in front of people. Mm. Because I, it's funny, I'm about to say, I'm a really bad public speaker. We just said we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come listen to me speak in public. I'll be terrible. <laughs> I am, I'm not a comfortable public speaker, is what I'll say. Uh, in school, I hated doing speeches. I had so much anxiety uh, around them. Like, if I would basically, if I knew I had to do a speech like on a Friday, the entire week I'd be dreading it. I'd be seeing if I can get out of it. I'd be like, you know, I'd be shaking when I got up there. Like, I'm, it's just not something I've been good at. I've, I've gotten better at it because as you get into the workforce, as you like, you know, get into more settings with people, you just naturally actually get put in situations where you have to speak in front of three mm -hmm. people, five people, 10 people, whatever. running a YouTube channel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so Snake Oil is, is a game that you're going to naturally have a lot of people ar around the, the game playing. Sometimes, you know, pushing the limits of what the game even says that the player can't just like, it, sometimes we'll yeah. have like 12 people or 15 people, whatever. And the way we play is also even more nerve wracking for anyone that has anxiety speaking because we incorporate this house rule where you have to actually sing the jingle for the product that you're selling. And so I guess I didn't yeah. say snake oil. You're basically taking two cards that have words in your hand, making a product out of those two words like snake and oil, and then selling that in the pitch for like, you know, 30 seconds a minute, whatever you decide. But we yeah, we had this jingle thing on. So me being someone who doesn't like talking in front of people, yeah, we played this with our friends that I feel comfortable with, but we've also played with like members of your family or members of like, you know, I've had a host room people that I only see casually, and I'm having right. to like pitch a product to everybody in a funny way, and then also sing a little and then jingle. sing at the end. Like yeah. it, it's it's nerve wracking, and, and everyone's quiet and watching you while it happens. Yeah. Like it, you're on the spot. And what I've learned is that most people just want to laugh, support you, and just like are just happy that you're involved and and it yeah. doesn't you know they don't really it's not like they're going to be like oh that guy seemed a little nervous or whatever especially people that are you know are close to you or whatever so it the snake oil has gone a long way and is one of the games not the only game but one of the games that has just made me feel more comfortable you know speaking in front of groups and in front of people so i should nice. play a whole bunch of snake oil uh this week this week and next week leading up to nice. <laughs> the conference <laughs> but yeah that's snake oil that's an awesome pick 
really, really glad this made it in. I had a couple other like sort of party games that were on my short list that didn't make it in, so I'm really glad we got something like this. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's an awesome game. And I think yeah. you're totally right. It's helped really? me with that too. And I think for me, like it's even more so the singing thing. Like yeah, I'm, I'm doing totally. more extra self conscious <laughs> about singing in front of people. And I, I remember <laughs> that was always the part. Like I didn't mind making the pitch as much, but there were a couple times where someone would be like, "The jingle, you forgot the jingle." And I'm like. Oh man, I got. <laughs> Why did we even create this house? We're just like <laughs> making this so difficult. I don't know, but ourselves. but there's been some great jingles that <laughs> we look true. back on and we're like we're glad the rule exists yeah. for a reason. Great so. game with in yeah. a way too big box. That's yeah, the only thing. That's box needs to be like this big. Yeah. But it, yeah, great, great game. Yeah, awesome game, awesome game. Okay, um, and you know what the other thing is too that would be really good for uh, people to just play it in like classroom kind of setting is that you can just play around. You don't even have yep. to commit to the rules and play the game the yep, way no it was. Time limit. You know, with just have some fun with whatever. it. All right, the next game here that taught me something. Actually, I would say it taught me a couple of main big things here. Oh, that is oh, Oath nice. Chronicles I didn't even of notice Empire that missing from my shelf. <laughs> yeah, so this is a game that we got sent to us by Leader Games a long time ago, around when it first, well, not a long time ago, I guess, around when it first came out. We reviewed it on our channel, so you can check out our review to know our full thoughts. Um, just teaser at the beginning we the title is called the most interesting game we've played i don't know about you i still think it's the most interesting game i've played I think so too um it's not a game i love there's you know again you can go watch the review to see what my issues are with the game and stuff like that but um the long and short of it is that it's sort of um it's not quite a legacy or campaign being uh, campaign game but it's a game that has an overarching story that goes from game to game and this game kind of changes uh, over time, there's cards that you get in this deck that are going to be removed and put into other decks, and the result of one game is going to carry over to the next game based on you know roles that players will have, based on how one game ended and the next one went, and so on. So it's kind of this you know epic game of asymmetry. One player is the chancellor, and the other players are kind of citizens in the land, and you each have your own little armies, and you're trying to move across this map that kind of starts with a bunch of locations hidden so you're discovering things as they go there's different ways the game can end i'm not going to get into it too much more because it's there's a lot to explain and it has been a few months now since we played it mm -hmm. um but there's two main things that this taught me and this one is more board game related i would say it kind of ties into real world in, real world in a way but I, I don't have as many like sort of like um, <laughs> next level yeah existential <laughs> life lessons is this guy i'm not as insightful as dylan or introspective apparently <laughs> Um, so the first thing that this taught me, game related, is that my that not only that my favorite type of narrative in games is from this type of thing, but just that you can have this strong of a narrative in a game that isn't billed as a storytelling game. Yeah. Like it's not a story game. It's not a game that you would read up about, and someone's like, "Oh, this is an adventure game," or you read out of a book and figure out what's going on, or you choose your own adventure. Like it's not that at all. It's a game where you actually play, like it's a kind of a war game and you're, you know, there's area majority stuff going on. You're fighting over territories and rolling dice to see if you, you know, overcame someone in battle somewhere and having alliances and negotiating over stuff and backstabbing people. And because of the way that every location, every card, every, you know, ability that you can do, every character power, every item that can change hands, all these things have their own unique identity. And as you play, the story tells itself. You go to an action space, you fight a battle, suddenly you can look back at, oh, like the whatever peak, you know, we fought this battle and then we went through the narrow pass here and there was this other cool thing that happened. And just by playing the game, you have a story at the end, like, and it gives you a little chronicle book and the person who wins writes in this chronicle and, you know, there's we've played other games before where you're reading out of a book and stuff like that and those have never quite done it for me when it comes to story i always end up feeling like i would rather just be reading a book rather than playing a board game where i'm reading story in the same way like i would rather have the story delivered in a very interesting way like this so i love that aspect and the second thing was more than any game i can think of since we started this channel this is the game i think that most taught me how to be critical towards games and that's because it's such a beautiful, like, stunning production. Like, the game is just pure eye candy. The components are incredible to look at. We played it with uh, some really close friends. We were laughing the whole time. It was an amazing experience, truly unique. And I kept, like, I was having so much fun the whole time we were playing, and we were excited to come back to the table, but over time I kept feeling like, what is it about the game that I'm not liking like there's things that are holding me back from being like hooked and really wanting to play it again um, and it really made me dive into like what was making and separate like am I having fun because I'm playing an awesome game with my friends and it's this unique interesting experience I've never had before and it's like 
it's the way that that's kind of like feeding my brain is like I'm feeling just like happy and positive about that or is it that I love 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 the game itself right so I love a lot of things about the game but yeah it definitely helped me have a critical eye towards the things I didn't like and kind of see past the what do you want to say like the window dressing or the yeah, kind yeah. of what pulled me in initially yeah I really like this pick uh, the only thing I'll add a uh, small thing to the the story stuff you mentioned is as you were saying it I think it almost clicked for me too that it's kind of taught me and I'm realizing it now that maybe this is like the answer to the question, how do you make a good narrative in board games? Mm -hmm. Because like I love yeah. I love Gloomhaven. Obviously, I've talked about it a bunch. I'm, I would I would I would never say Gloomhaven has an amazing story or even close. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like that's not what it does well. And even like games that focus on narrative, like Tainted Grail and all this kind of stuff, even the ones that have a good story, it's still like something about the board game setting can be a difficult thing to create a good narrative. Mm -hmm. And what's the one tabletop uh, game uh, that has um, like amazing narrative? Dungeons and Dragons, because you make the narrative yourself, mm -hmm. right? And and your narrative yeah. is changing. So like Oath is like riding this line between like the narrative of Dungeons and Dragons and narrative of board games where it's saying, it's like a campaign game that evolves, but you've created the memories, you've created the journal, you've created the story. Maybe what someone needs to come up with is a, if they want to, like the next time we want a campaign game that's gonna have like a strong narrative, is find a way to do a campaign game where you're really creating the story like you do an oath. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's loose in that sense, but the memories and stuff and who takes over all the stuff is what you carry on and stuff. Like yeah. that's a strong, that's a strong feeling. Like that's the, that was the easily the best part of both when we played. For sure. And it's part of the way that the game is structured where you feel that squeeze at the end where it gets close to the end of that eighth round and there's the die rolls and you feel that pinch of if I don't win here or if I don't put pressure here, this game is gonna so it kind of it creates the game arc yep. naturally just by the rule set. It's incredibly impressive and yeah. just yeah. Something that I think, if you're up for like a, a rule set this heavy, I think this is someone that everyone should experience. Like again, if, if you're up for it, but yeah, a yeah, lot to learn from a game like Oath. Um, yeah, one of a kind game, I'd say. Awesome pick. Okay, my next one is going to be one that you're gonna, your first thought is gonna be like, oh, you squeeze this into the video. But uh, <laughs> but I swear I actually have like, this is a little, I guess Marvel a little, Champions? A little bit more catered towards me. Uh, but I think anyone who's played this game has ended up learning this, so. Okay. Yeah, it's Marvel Champions. No, it is. <laughs> uh, so, I I've mentioned this a few times, especially in Marvel Champions videos. I didn't really read a lot of comics growing up, but I've always, always like I'm, I'm I've always been a huge nerd, and and I love the idea of superheroes, and I'm a huge Marvel movie fan. Like I watch every single one religiously. I've seen them all, uh, you know, numerous times. So. I've always been fascinated and loved the lore and the ideas and behind the characters and everything, but I've just never for whatever reason got hooked on sitting down and reading the comic books and now it's hard for me to get into it because it's just there's so much out there and there's mm -hmm. so many starting points. Marvel Champions taught me so much about characters that I had no idea about and got me mm -hmm. interested in them that now some of those characters are showing up in TV shows and movies that I'm seeing them on screen and I'm like, oh, that's an adaptation of this character or this, mm. you know, or this amalgamation of these two characters because I've played them in Marvel Champions and the theme is so well integrated here that I will understand yeah. things about a character's power or psyche or whatever before they even come come into play on the, the, the screen because of specifically learning from Marvel Champions. So mm -hmm. I legitimately learned about superheroes and lore and I did not read the comic books growing up aside from like the odd Spider-Man or the odd, you know, whatever. So I just think that in terms of like, yeah, this is like, it's not like it's something you're learning that's like this huge, you know, takeaway that's uh, in the same way of learning something that's like science or birds, or whatever. But I think that if you have any kind of passing interest in, you know, comic books and superheroes and this kind of this kind of realm of stuff you're going to actually learn a lot about this game just because of how or from this game because of how well the theme and the characters are actually integrated into it that's true yeah it's just uh it's just a really that's honestly been one of my favorite parts of marvel champions yes i love the solo aspect and the deck building and all that kind of stuff but i just think that every time i open a pack or a new character pack i i'm like how have they integrated this character and even if it's a character like like spider ham that i i know nothing about i'm like I'm excited to learn about this character and to be like how they turned him into a functional, you know, thing that I'm controlling. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's just, it's a, it's great designers doing something that they're passionate about and that they love, and you can tell they're having fun doing it. And it just like it, you can see it on every single card that you read. So. Yep. As someone who like I'm not a particularly huge fan of the, like I think it's a great game. It's just maybe not as much for me, and I don't have anything against the Marvel theme, but I'm nowhere near as into it as you yeah. are. And the four or five times I've played this with you, I feel like I've learned about 
like even the ones that I knew something about, like Spider-Man and Iron Man and stuff, um, I feel like I've always learned about being like, hey, what's the deal with this card? And sometimes I've asked you, what are the cards that are like referring to like drawbacks that the heroes have? Oh, there's you're actually asking me now. Yeah, Sorry, I thought you were. No, no, there's they're like requirements. There's <laughs> oh, like one that's obligations. like obligations. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes. Like I thought that was such a cool way yeah, to incorporate. Awesome. Like, hey, it's not necess- It's usually going to be like a bad or inconvenient mm-hmm. card, but it's part of your character's backstory. And like, yeah. I felt like that was such a cool part of it when I was playing with you. So yeah, yeah that's a great pick. Yeah, Marvel Champions, and there's there's the Marvel Champions pick for all the Marvel. Yeah, Champions when you fans. when you got, I was a bit surprised. I was like, when is he going to spin this one? But like, it's true. Yeah, you do I learn about it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and the last one on the list. Uh, there's probably a little bit of bias here, but I, I couldn't possibly leave this off the list. Oh, okay. I, th- I thought it was going to be Agricola. <laughs> oh, no. No, I knew uh, I knew the basics thing. of farming yeah. before playing Agricola. I knew it was a, a tough life to get into. No. Uh, so this is Liege Boat. I don't know if this box is... That's okay. I can hide behind it. That's cool. fine. <laughs> so, yeah, this is... Um, this came out a few years ago, uh, obviously is kind of uh, about the city of Lisbon, Lisboa in Portugal, and this is set, uh, the game is basically a simulation of what happened after the uh, major earthquake in 1755, wiped out basically a good chunk, almost the entire city, uh, There was the city was on fire for a few days, there was tsunami as well after all this, so basically the city was in ruins and you are put in the role of someone who's basically going to interact with the locals, you know, the king, the, the church, etc, uh, to rebuild the city. So um, I won't get too much more into the rules from that, but there's, you know, you have ships, you're buying and selling goods, you have cards that you're playing to kind of interact with the king and the minister of finance and things like that throughout the game. It's just, it's one of the most thematic games I've ever played, and it's one of the games where, um, even though it's very, very heavy, very complex, actually, like, the second reason I was going to say is not only has this taught me a lot about the theme and this, like, part of history, but it is, I say it's taught me, like, a lot because it is the heaviest, most complex game, just in terms of the weight on BGG. I haven't played any other games that are like rated as being heavier than this so it teaches you how to learn sense, games better <laughs> exactly it teaches you how to learn yeah straight up it teaches yeah. you how to learn heavy games and how to strategize on a on a bigger scale kind of thing like it yeah. is there's a lot to take in there's a lot of moving parts on the board there's you know making a lot of decisions where you can't yet see the ramifications of your actions like i'm going to do this but i don't know until maybe six or seven turns from now if that's going to pay off for me in the long run so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on and then yeah you just learn about the history and these people and even just again the combination between like church and state there's things that come into play and and every time you have like a rules question or you're like why would that be that you read and there's a little portion in the rule book um under almost every rule that has like a little thematic explanation like well in this year you know so and so would meet with so and so and they would exchange this and you're like oh okay that makes sense so everything has a thematic tie-in so yeah i feel like i kind of leveled up as a gamer so like i improved my skills and and sort of just like knowledge of games um but also the theme is just like yeah it's so so well done in here um game i highly recommend everyone try again if you're up for that incredibly complex uh game yeah i it's i mean i I, everything i would have said is what you said i'll just add that like yeah we're there's bias because we're interested in like something like the history of, of Lisbon and Portugal and stuff like that because we're from there. But yeah. if you're if there, if you have any like you know minor interest in that is as long as you can get past the fact that it is kind of dense in in the rules of the game and also mm. in the the theme and stuff itself, it is a great example of a game that just like takes this something from history like a historical thing and turns it into a, a game where it's like. Like, I, I don't know, I've never read up on the actuals to know how accurate it is, but from everything you've told me and everything I've seen in the game, it seems fairly accurate mm-hmm. and, you know, realistic to, to what the actual situation was. So, yeah, I think it's a great pick. Cool. And I love it because the Portugal connection. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, it's a Portuguese designer. So, again, it's similar to what we were talking about with Wingspan with the bird theme. Like, it's not someone who's just like, oh, what's a popular thing that people will be interested in? It's like, no, this person picks something that was passionate to them, and you can see, like, the game is... Again, dripping with theme and just very, very thematic. So, yeah, yeah Lishboa, lot to learn from it. Great choice. Um, Thank you, sir. All right, my last one I don't have to pull up here, uh, and it is a game that's been around since, what is it, 1991, 1993? I think it's 93, somewhere in there. Um, and it's still going strong, and that is Magic the Gathering. Oh, nice. um, And so Magic the Gathering is on here for a couple of cool reasons, and I'm going to get existential again. I guess all my picks are some <laughs> existential. Because yeah. uh, we played Magic the Gathering for, for a while, I think, both of us played and didn't realize we but we each played and then found out we did and it became this thing that bonded us. Yeah, like grade um, six, grade seven, something like yeah. that, right? Yeah, and then I met people in my elementary and junior high that played and I play with. I, I know friends still today that, that play and I we went to a pre-release recently just for fun. Um, 
it's a game that taught me two big things. First one might surprise some people because Magic is not a solo game, but I was an only child um, for the first, like, my, my sister is 14 years younger than me, so for the, a large part, portion of my life until I was like 16 or, or, or something like that. Um, and to be 14? If she's 14 years Yeah, sorry, you? right. <laughs> 14 years younger than me, so like 16. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> and... Um, so I, I did. I, I got really good, in, and I don't mean this in a negative way. I, I love it uh, about finding really creative ways to entertain myself. Like I, I loved playing with figurines. I loved like taking things that uh, toys, whatever um, things that I had. I, I created. I created Sky Cup, which we've talked yeah, about a few times, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I really loved doing that, and I got really creative in a lot of ways. And Magic the Gathering, and I, I mean, I could have lumped in, like, Pokemon cards here, too, honestly, You know what else but, is, just real quick, every yeah. time, all those video games that have the create-your-own-level never interested me, but Dylan was always creating new <laughs> levels, and it was always really cool stuff, and that was a huge difference between us, and so that's another one where I yeah. think you maybe have overlooked. And I'm sure that comes from, like, yeah, like I said, being an only child, finding ways to entertain yourself, but um, Magic the Gathering is a game that I spend probably as much time playing by myself and, and fiddling with decks and all that kind of stuff that as I did playing with others. I would play decks against each other, do little tournaments where I played each one equally mm -hmm. as I thought that those people would, and I would do this for hours. I mean, we would do that in the same room where we'd play our own games, but then also play each other and stuff like that. Yeah. So it really taught me how to even be more, you know, content and happy on my own, which is something I really value as a skill having today. Like I, 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 I don't feel like when I'm by myself or I live alone or whatever that like I'm like oh I'm lonely or oh this like I I enjoy it I like my my, my free time and I think that all comes from things like Magic the Gathering um, the other big thing that it's taught me and I think this is probably one of the biggest things of anything I mentioned today and it ties into so much stuff that we get into with board games is that there are some really really strong and amazing communities when it comes to games mm. and and I should preface this by saying that like, every game and every like niche and everything has it you know it's it's bad apples and people that are going to take a game too seriously or care too much about the the meta and and you know want, and be like well you shouldn't have that deck like we've we've encountered mm. that and and it happens but there is such a strong community around Magic the Gathering, and the reason I even put this on this list is because when I went to this pre-release, -re -pre um, you know, a couple months ago, um, just locally here, seeing how friendly everyone was at the table, how supportive everyone was, people I don't even know sitting down to build their decks, uh, their pre-release decks next to us and having conversations and learning about their history with the game and when, when they got out of it and when they got back into it, and just... There was, no one was mean, no one was cruel, everyone was so happy to, to be there. It was just, mm -hmm. those type of communities is like everything we're talking about, about like, you know, uh, mental health being such a thing that can be fostered and so positive in board games. Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. when you have these people that gather, and yeah, we do it for games in general, but sometimes when you meet around one specific thing, it's like the passion is so much stronger because it's like we're so into Dungeons and Dragons or we're so into, mm -hmm. you know, chess or whatever that yeah. being into like this shared passion and ma like Magic Gathering just brings you together stronger. And it brought us together. It brought like we would go to like tournaments for like whatever set was out at the time. And even just the people we met there and the trades we did, we're feeling close to these people we don't even know. So it mm -hmm. just like it's such a good community builder. I think it taught me it was the first game I think that probably taught me like there can be a community mm -hmm. around games. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, that's that's magic. Another yeah, awesome right. pick. <laughs> An explanation. I feel a little out of my depth here sitting next to Dylan. <laughs> and I don't think I've mentioned Magic the Gathering in any video yet, or if I have, it's been like once. We've, and I don't we've probably know mentioned when we're talking about other two-player games, like, oh, we yeah, used to play Magic, yeah. but we haven't really given it its due Got diligence it. in terms of how much we played it over the years and how yeah. yeah how big it was for us getting into games. So yeah, so yeah that's is. an awesome pick. Yeah, that's my last pick. Cool. Well, yeah, that's, uh, those are our 10 games that uh, can teach you and that obviously taught us something. Um, we would just like to remind you, for anyone who missed it at the beginning of the video, might have skipped that part. Uh, part of the reason we decided to do this video is we have been asked to speak uh, at a pro uh, professional development day for educators here in Manitoba. So if you are an educator here in Manitoba, uh, we hope to see you there. It's Friday, October 21st. Uh, the topic is board games and mental health. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for watching this video. Let us know what games have taught you. If you have any specific, you know, stories you want to share. Um, again, it can be something super introspective like Dylan. It can be something <laughs> that is about the game or about board games in general. Uh, or games you think uh, would be good for teaching others. We'd love to hear from you. So as always, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.